Uh, Sarah, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you as CEO of the 1020 Foundation today uh, for a conversation where I'm particularly interested in exploring leadership in the context of the work that you're doing. What type of leadership, Sarah, is required for systemic change? Um, leadership, uh, typically, as, as we know it and the way the textbooks describe it, I think is much more around an individual at the moment. And the individual stands out front very strongly, has a vision and, and sort of aligns people to that vision. The shift in systemic work, and particularly, again, around an, a collective impact approach, is that the leader actually sits behind. And the, the, the key for leadership is the ability to engage a really complex system of stakeholders and align them around an effort. And that starts with relationship building. And it's a, a real focus actually um, on not just technical expertise, because I think that's assumed in any leader. It's actually about the piece around adaptive work, around the softer skills that we really in our society at the moment um, haven't acknowledged as important. So Sari, what have you done to develop some of those leadership capabilities personally? The journey that I've been on with 1020 as the, the CEO and in tackling systems change and catalytic philanthropy has really had to start right from within. And I've had to put in place with some rigour and discipline practices that enable me to really understand how I show up in the space and engage both with communities but my peers and other organisations. So Sarah, have you got a particular example you know, where that's sort of been, where you've learned a lot from the sort of things that we're talking about? I've got a lot of examples, <laughs> but there's one that comes to mind because it was the first engagement we had with the community as 1020, and it was at a time when I was feeling personally very pressured. The board wanted to see some results and wanted a grant to be made. And in the, if you like, organisational drive to please our, my, my board and to, you know, make myself look good in the end, I suppose, is what it came down to. We didn't develop a relationship with that community. We went in and overlaid a whole lot of expectations and urgency that was completely driven from our own philanthropic entity and wasn't about engaging with the community. It wasn't about sitting with the community. It wasn't about spending time listening to what worked for them. So that relationship fell apart. And I take real personal responsibility for that. And we've since had you know, good learning conversations. And I think this is really about um, organisations, particularly philanthropics, understanding what it means to be in a learning organisation. Um, the learning in that has enabled us to completely reframe. Uh, one of the really interesting points that you've raised is the importance of the role that board plays in this leadership space in facilitating and supporting catalytic philanthropic organisations? Look, it is. And we've got the privilege of being a start-up organisation so, and, and very openly being a learning organisation. And I just have to start by saying our board has been fantastic at going on this learning journey with us and acknowledging that even the, they have a long way to go um, in, in understanding what the work and what the skills are to do it. But what we've found has been really important is to get strategic clarity. What is it that we're trying to achieve? And it doesn't matter that it's very clear to all of us that we can't do that on our own, but what is it in the early childhood space we want to see? What are these results? And how then as a catalytic philanthropic organisation can we make a contribution? Are we best placed to make a contribution? So Sarah, this notion of strategic impact it puts a different onus on the foundation, both from a CEO and from a board perspective, in terms of monitoring progress. Can we talk a little bit about what does it mean when you're working for strategic impact across the system? It's what keeps me awake at night because we've been particularly very transparent and, and open in saying we want to achieve some particular population level indices. And as, a, as an organisation and with the team, we had to sit down and say, well, look, if that's the level of population level change we want to see over a 10-year 10, 10 period minimum, because that's what it's going to take, what's our role in that? What are the, who are the groups involved and what's our role in contributing to building the capacity in those groups so that they can then deliver the change that needs to happen in communities to sh shift those outcomes. And so we had to really spend a lot of time getting clarity on who we are and what we are in the system and what our contribution was. And then um, be quite diligent, and it's a hard process, in setting some metrics and performance measures, uh, sort of a report carding that our board could use at each of their board meetings to say, how are we tracking as an organisation in our contribution towards where the end game is, which so is the population level change. 
And so, Sari, a lot of those times, that those sorts of metrics are around things like number of grants, dollars granted. Are your metrics those types of metrics, or have you have you explored other metrics because you're more focused on aligning with or understanding the impact that you're having on the system? You know, of course, at the end of the day, there has to be some accountability around how much money you're, you're putting and what are you achieving for that money. But some of the measures that we use for, for ourselves are much more around to what extent uh, is much more feedback from the communities, which is the tricky piece, because in actually determining our impact, we need to engage with our partners at a much more detailed level to understand where they're at in their collaborative process and how we can then best respond and adapt in the quickest time possible to, for them to, you know, to support them progressing to the next stage. So, Sari, the other really important element of this is how you support leaders and communities. Can you talk a little bit about what the foundation is doing to support their work? Well, I think one of the biggest things that we've been able to do, particularly in terms of um, community-driven collective impact, is find the leaders. Find these people who are, have this unique set of skills who are coordinating and driving change in their communities across multiple stakeholders and in a very accountable way. And these people are really unique and they're often, it's very lonely for them. So in finding them, we're shining the light on them. In the bigger macro system, we often go to the same CEOs of the same large NGOs that sit across the system. And what we're trying to do is to say they're really important but the leaders who are critical to this work are in the community and they have this incredible skill to convene, to facilitate, to drive, to hold people accountable, to manage multiple stakeholders around a change agenda. It's additionally, to finding them, it's about providing support and resources to them to ensure that there's longevity or even that they've got a succession plan in place so that often what happens in communities is people go, they burn out, who is it that might step in? So we do, we're doing that by building a learning system that includes some peer-to-peer -peer learning. So there's the, the reflective space, there's the recognition of others on the journey and that they're not the only ones and, and a sense of feeling part of a movement, I suppose, which is really important for these people because it is so lonely, lonely. But the other part of it is actually resourcing them in their day-to-day -day work uh, where we can and where we can connect you know, others to. Thank you very much, Sarah.